Who's checking it while they're in the plane? That was great. <laughs> So everyone, we are at four. What we're going to do is we're going to summarize scenes one through three, and then we're going to act out scene four. He's going to be the narrator for it. He's going to narrate a little. We're going to act, narrate, act. This is also going to be a modern version. It's not out of the book. Okay, in scene one, it's really, really short scene. It's springtime. Uh, Perdita is 16 years old now the daughter of King Leontes. She was raised as a shepherd's daughter, so she's really shy, she's really meek. And in the end of it, Florizel is finally mentioned as the king's son. Okay, scene two, Polixene, um, is at Polixene's castle in um, Bohemia. Um, Polixene and Camillo are talking about Camillo wanting to go back home to Sicily for two reasons, he's homesick and he believes that the grieving Leontes will need his comfort, because um, he's been away for 16 years. So, but Polixenes was like, no, I need you here. I can't run a kingdom without you. And they also discuss the fact that his son, Florizel, has been absent from his duties as a prince, and they decide to disguise themselves to go check up on him. Um, in scene four, Otto, I mean, scene three, Otto Lussis is singing of spring, he ends up stealing coins from the clown while he was helping him get up. And then Otto Lysis convinces the clown someone else had robbed him and walks off singing again. Okay. Um, scene four. Scene four <laughs> begins with, uh, you see, Perdita for the first time, and she is adorned with flowers. Um, she enters distributing flowers to the character's present on stage. And dialogue between Perdita and Florizel quickly shows that the two are in love. <coughs> She expresses concern that Florizel's father is bound to oppose their union because she is uh, not of noble birth, and to which he declares that she, he will be thine, my fair, or not my father's. Um, this time the, sh the, sh the sheep shearing begins, and Florizel, under the alias of Doricles, um, is present. The shepherd comes in with a crowd and orders Perdita to act as a hostess. Hello, daughter. When my old wife was alive, on this day she would be sourman, butler, cook, both lady and servant. She welcomed everyone, served everyone, sang, dance, here and now, at the tip of the end of the table, now in the middle. Leaning on his shoulder than his, her face would be red with the work, and with the drink she had to cool down with, she would toast to each of them, You are not shy, as if you were a guest and not the hostess of the gathering. Please give these friends who are strangers to us welcome. That's the way to get us better acquainted. Come, stop blushing, and introduce yourself as the mistress of the feast. Come one and welcome us to your sheep sharing, and may your good flock prosper. Sir, welcome. My daddy told me that I need to be the hostess for today. Um, Camelio, you're welcome, <coughs> sir. Dorcas gave me these, those flowers. Respected gentlemen, here is a rosemary and root for you. These keep their looks and scent all wear long. So you're good to go. Blessings and friendship to both of you. And welcome to our sharing. Thank you. You're welcome. Shepherdess, a lovely one you are. You've matched our ages nicely with the flowers of winter. Sir, the year is getting on. It's not yet autumn or the start of chilly winter, but the loveliest flowers of this season are carnations and multicolored gilly flowers, which some call nature's bastards. <laughs> We don't have that sort of uh, flowers in our rustic garden. Uh-uh. And I don't want to grow them. <laughs> Why, gentle maiden, don't you grow them? Because I have heard it said that their multicolored looks are artificially flavored, or colored, whatever, created. What if they are? Nature can only be made better by things she has created herself. So what you call artificial <laughs> is, in fact, made by men who are made by nature. You see, sweet maid, we graft a gentle nature on the wildest plants and improve the lower things. By adding the seeds of a nobler race, this is an art which corrects nature, or rather changes it, but it is still nature. Yes, it is. So fill your garden with gilly flowers and do not call them bastards. <laughs> I want to put the hoe into the earth. 
to plant a single one of them. This will never use it. No more so than I would if I were to wear makeup. And this youth said that he liked it and only wanted to breed with me because of it. That's so wrong. Here are flowers for you. Hot lavender, <laughs> mint, savory, marjoram, and the marigold, which goes to sleep with the sun and rises with the dew. These are the flowers of the middle of summer. And I think I'm giving them to the men of middle age. You're very welcome. Get flowers. Here's your flowers. Bloxonese remarks to Grillo <laughs> that Brigida is the prettiest uh, old shepherd lowborn lass that has ever seen on the Greensward. Um, he then asked the shepherd about her suitor before, please. And he responds that he is a high one. Tell me, good shepherd, what handsome lad is this who dances with your daughter? They call him Doricles. He says he owns a good estate. I have his word on it. I believe it. He looks honest, you know, for the most part. Uh, he says he loves my daughter. I believe that, too. For the moon never looked down on the water in the same way as he will stand looking into my daughter's eyes. And to be honest with you, I don't think there's any difference in their devotion to each other. Well, she dances beautifully. She does everything beautifully. Although, I say it myself. If young Dora please chooses her, she will bring him things he cannot dream of. <laughs> I'm sorry right now, in case you haven't. <laughs> oh, master, if you only heard the peddler at the door, you would never want to dance to the whistle and drum again. You wouldn't care for the bagpipes. He sings different tunes faster than you can count money. He sings them as if he had eaten the music sheets, and everyone bends their ears to his tune. Well, he couldn't have come at a better time. Let him in. I'm exceedingly fond of ballads. If it has a sad subject with a merry tune, or a merry subject, it's a sad music. He has songs for men and women of all sizes. No milliner can make a better fit with his gloves. He has the prettiest love songs for girls, completely without vulgarity, <coughs> which is unusual. With such delicate, nonsensical choruses, jump her and thump her. And when some foul, foul mouthed rascal wants to make mischief and put some vulgarity into the song, he makes he has made the answer, Whoop, do me no harm, good man. Pushes him away and puts him down with whoop, do me no do me no harm, good man. Well this sounds like a good chap. Um, so Autolysis in a pelage costume sets out selling the <coughs> clown and the shepherd just, and sings with the entire group. Um, as he's in the middle of his singing, uh, Bloxenes to Florizel asks why he has not bought anything for his love. Um, to which Florizel responds that he knows Brigida does not desire such silly things. And at this moment he decides to ask the shepherd to steal their uh, betrothal. Um, Florizel, upon hearing this, excuse me, Bloxenes, upon hearing this, asks Florizel why he hasn't consulted his father, to which he replies that there are reasons which he dare not share. Um, at this instant, Philoxenes casts off his disguise, declares that betrothal shall not go forward, and the shepherd is to be uh, executed, and Perdita's face is to be scratched with briars. Um, Florizel is to be disinherited, he pretty much just freaks out. Um, uh, Florizel is to be disinherited if he ever speaks of her again. Um, then he relents, decides to spare the life of the shepherd, and for his face. Um, but warns him that they, if they never speak to them again, they will forfeit them. Master, there are three carters, three shepherds, three cowherds, three swineherds that have dressed themselves up in skins. They call themselves saltiers, and they have a dance with the girl, which gir the girls say is a mess because they are not in it. But they would like to please you with it if it's not too rough for those who don't do anything more exciting than a game of bowls. Go away. We won't have it. There's been too much vulgar tomfoolery already. I know, sir. We are tiring you. You're only tiring the ones that are entertaining us. Please, let's have a look at these four trios of herdsmen. One of the trios, according to them, sir, has danced for the king. And the best one of the three can jump exactly 12 and a half feet. Oh, quit your jabbering. 
Since these good men have agreed, let them come in. Look sharp about it. Why? They're just at the door, sir. Here is a dance of the twelve satires. Oh, father, you'll know you'll never know more about that later. Hasn't this gone far enough? <laughs> it's time to separate them. <laughs> He's simple and has, to has told us plenty. Hello there, fair shepherd. Your heart is full of something that takes your mind off the feast. I swear, when I was young and fell in love as you have, I used to load my girl with gifts. I would have stripped the peddler's silken treasury and offered it all to her. You have to <coughs> let her go without doing a single deal. If your girl takes this the wrong way and accuses you of lack of love or generosity, you would be hard-pressed for a reply, at least if you care about making her happy. Old gentleman, I know. She doesn't care about these fripperies. The gifts she wants from me are packed and locked up in my heart, which I have given already but not delivered. Let me make my vows of love before this ancient gentleman, who would seem was once a lover himself. I take your hand, this hand, as soft as an Ethiopian's tooth, with a blown snow that's been twice sifted by the north wind. What's all this? How much nicer the young lad seems to make the hand that was lovely already. I have upset you, but on to your protestation. Let me hear what you have to say. Do, and you can witness it. And my neighbor here too? Him too, and more than him, and men, the earth, the heavens, and all. So that if I were crowned the most powerful monarch and fully deserved it, if I was the most handsome monarch and fully deserved it, if I was the most handsome youth that ever caught the eye, had greater strength and knowledge than any other man that I had, I would not value them without their love. I would use them all for her. I would offer them to her service or else get rid of them. A good offer. This shows a true love. But, my daughter, do you feel the same way? I cannot speak as well. Nothing so good. Nor could I mean better. I shake my boss exactly to the mold of his. Join your hands, then. It's a deal. And, unknown friends, you will witness it. I give my daughter to him, and will give her a dowry to match his fortune. Oh, the fortune must be the virtues of your daughter. When one person is dead, I shall have more than you can ever dream of. Well, let's wait until that happens. But come on, join us in front of these witnesses. Um, so after Philoxenes rips off his disguise, tells him that he's going to scratch for Dita's face and kill uh, the shepherd. He relents. Um, they exit. <coughs> and, uh, you see Florizel. He remains unfazed and, and assures Perdita that they will not be separated. He is willing to give up anything, everything and flee Bohemia immediately. Um, Camilo, to this, advises against it, but there is no stopping uh, Florizel. He promised that he would not break his oath to Perdita. Camilo gets the idea to flee at once, to, uh, advises Florizel to flee at once to Sicilia, where he, um, where Leontis, were thinking that he is sent from Philoxenes and that he will welcome. Um, at the same time, Camilla promises to get Philoxenes to come around to the notion of his son marrying a lowborn, but secretly he hopes that Philoxenes will accompany him and bring Camilla because he wants to return to Sicilia. Um, Florizel agrees, but is worried because he doesn't have the proper retinue to appear in Leontes' court as Biloxenes' son. And Camilla then promises to furnish him with the necessary components. This is when uh, Autolacus Otto comes in, and Camilla asks him to exchange clothes with Florizel. Florizel puts on the robes of a beggar <coughs> and to get to the, so he can get to the ship undetected by Biloxenes. Autolysis, uh, or Autolacus, <coughs> Players, he knows their business, but will not tell the king, since that would be a good deed, and good deeds are against his nature. I understand what's going on. I've heard it. To have an open ear, a quick eye, and a nimble hand is necessary for a pickpocket. You also need a good nose to sniff out work for the other senses. I can see this is the time for the criminal type to prosper. What a swap this would have been without any reward. What a reward I got with this swap. It's certain the gods have decided this is my year. I don't even need to plan anything. The prince himself is up to no good. Sneaking away from his father with his ball and chain. If I thought it was the honest thing to do, to let the king know about it, I wouldn't do it. I think it is more wicked to keep it hidden. And so I stick to the rules of my profession. You see, what position you're in now, the only thing is to tell the king she's a changeling and no relation of yours. No, but listen to me. 
No, you listen. No, no, you listen to me. <laughs> well, go on then. If she is not your flesh and blood, your flesh and blood is not a the king, and so your flesh and blood will not be punished by him. Show him those things you found in there, those secret things, all except what she's taken with her. When you've done this, the law can't touch you. I promise. I'll tell the king every word. Yes, and what his son's been up to as well, <coughs> who I might add, is not a good man, either to his father or to me, going around trying to make me the king's brother-in-law. Indeed, you have been at least his brother-in-law, and then your blood would have been worth more. I can tell you the price per ounce. Very clever, puppies. Well, let's go to the king then. We got some things in this bundle that'll make him think. I don't know how what they're doing will block my master's flight. We must hope he'll be at the palace. Although I am not naturally honest, I'm occasionally by accident. Let me take off my peddler's disguise. Hello there, peasants. Where are you off to? To the palace, if you worship a dress. Tell me what your business is there. With whom? What's in that bundle? Where you live? Your names, your ages, your parentage, and ancestry, and any other thing that can be decently told. No, no, no. no. We are just playing folks, sir. That's a lie. You are rough and hairy. Don't give me any lies. That's only for tradesmen. And they often give we soldiers the lie, but we pay them for it with minted coins, not stabbing words. And so they do not give us the lie. Your worship would have given us a lie if you hadn't just corrected yourself. Please, sir, are you a courtier? Whether it pleases me or not, I am a courtier. Can't you see the courtly cut of my clothes? Don't I walk like a courtier? Don't I smell like a courtier? Don't I look on your vulgarity, vulgarity with the contempt of court? Do you think that just because I'm asking you about your business that makes me no courtier? I am a courtier head to foot, and I will either help or hinder your business at court. So I'm telling you to tell me what it is. My business, sir, is with the king. Who do you have to speak for you? Mm, I don't know, if you please. Advocate is the court warden for pheasant. Say you haven't any? None, sir. I have no pheasant, neither cock nor hen. How blessed we are, who are not simple. But, but nature could have made me like this, these, <coughs> so I won't look down on them. This can only be a great courtier. He has expensive clothes, but wears them badly. He seems to be more noble in his peculiarities. I'll bet he's a great man. I can tell by the way he picks his teeth. The bundle there? What's in the bundle? Why do you have that box? Sir, there are such secrets in this bundle and box that only the king can know, and which he shall know of within the hour if I can get within speaking distance of him. Old man, you've missed your chance. Why, sir? The king is not at the palace. He has gone on board a new ship to shake off depression and get some air. For if you pay attention to important matters, you must know the king is full of sadness. That's what I've heard, sir. I've heard about a son who is going to mar marry a shepherd's daughter. That shepherd isn't under arrest yet. He should <laughs> run. The, the curses he will get, the tortures he will feel, will break the back of a man, the heart of a monster. You think so, sir? Not only he will suffer what punishment they can come up with, those who are close to him, even if hardly related, will all be given to the hangman. It will be a great shame, but it has to be done. An old sheep-keeping scoundrel, a ram tender, offering to make <coughs> his daughter a royal. Some say he will be stones, but that death is too soft for him, I say. Dragging our throne into a sheep pen, there is not enough death or pain to punish him. That's it. Thank <laughs> you.